All right, welcome back to part two of our Tech TV interview series. Today I have the man, the myth, the legend, Leo Laporte. As you know, Leo Laporte was a big personality on ZDTV as well as Tech TV. And today you can catch him on This Week in Tech. Uh, it's his own podcasting network that Leo started. There's a lot of really, really great shows on there. So Leo, thank you for, for joining me and taking time out of your schedule. Let's, let's jump right into this. ZDTV was pretty groundbreaking in that it was an entire network devoted to technology. Can you talk a little bit about the early days of ZDTV? What was the culture like in the network? So I actually uh, started with Ziff Davis in the early 90s. I had been doing a radio show, call-in radio show uh, with John C. Dvorak, which we syndicated, I think, around 92. And I got a call one day from a guy named Halsey Miner. Uh, he's a hedge fund guy back east. And he said, we want to start a cable TV network devoted to technology, to computers. And since you're the only guy really doing an inter a national radio show, we thought we should talk to you. One thing led to another. Uh, and uh, Halsey uh, hired me for this company he was starting called CNET. Uh, there were just the three of them at the time, I think. There was Halsey, his partner, a marketing person. Um, I did a little due diligence for them uh, per their request. And I said, Halsey, it's, uh, you know, if CNN is any example, it took them 10 years to make any money. Uh, and they spent about half a billion dollars to do it. <laughs> so <laughs> uh, unless you got half a billion dollars in 10 years, I probably wouldn't start a technology TV station. That turned out to be prescient. He went on uh, to, of course, start seeing at the website with some additional TV shows, syndicated TV shows to promote it, which worked out very well for him. CNET did very well. Uh, but he let me go after a couple of years. I remember him calling me into his office, which by then was a abandoned railroad car in uh, San Francisco's North Beach area. This is where CNET actually offices were located. Uh, but he had the railway car. And he <laughs> abandoned sounds like it was a dump. It was very nice. He pulled me in and he said, I mean, it was basically a, a non-firing firing he said, here's a press release from Ziff Davis. They're starting a TV enterprise. You should talk to them. Uh, by which I had understood that I was no longer employed by him. So I uh, did, in fact, talk to them. Went to New York City to meet with uh, Bill McCrone, who was editor-in-chief of PC Magazine at the time and responsible for Ziff Davis's TV ventures. And uh, he and uh, their TV consultant... Um, talked to me for a little while. I think I convinced them that I knew what I was talking about. And they said, great, you're hired. Um, now let's figure out what we're going to do. <laughs> they ended up starting a TV show uh, featuring Gina Smith and Jim, Jim Latterback uh, called The Personal Computing Show. They bought airtime for it on CNBC and some other places. Um, after a while, I ended up hosting that show. Um, we did it for a season they had a very complicated premise. They were going to have a half hour real editorial show followed by some amount of time, hours perhaps, of computer shopping that would then pay for everything. They never got the computer shopping off the ground. They eventually abandoned the personal computing show. But they didn't fire me and Gina. We were, everybody else was gone, but we were, uh, we were still as if Davis employees for ZD Television. Uh, the idea being, let's create uh, some sort of continued television presence for this, which was the, at the time the biggest publisher of computer magazines. Computer Shopper, PC Magazine, et cetera, et cetera. So uh, Gina and I just kind of floated around for a while. They really didn't seem that interested. <laughs> Until, uh, I think it was the Christmas, it was right before Christmas in, uh, would have been ninety three, maybe 94, uh, when I got an urgent call from Bill McCrone saying, hey, Microsoft 
is investing in a new TV network with with uh, NBC. They're going to call it MSNBC, and they want a flagship technology program every night of the week to make Microsoft happy. NBC wanted this. So we need a pitch. So I wrote a pitch. This is, again, like the week before Christmas. We flew out to New York. Uh, Bill and I and a few others uh, pitched it to uh, Andy Lack, who at the time was the uh, VP News at uh, NBC or president of news at NBC. He wasn't a VP. He was a president. And uh, they gave us a green light. And we produced a show which ended up being called The Site on MSNBC for uh, a couple of years, about a year and a half we did that. At the same time as we were doing that, ZD thought we should start a channel, a network, a cable channel. They've probably foolishly told MSNBC about this. Uh, MSNBC ended up canceling the site. And at that point, I was kind of up in the air. They had hired somebody, Candy Myers, to uh, put together this technology channel, ZDTV. I guess they finally settled on the name ZDTV. And uh, it wasn't clear that they were going to hire me at all, which was kind of annoying since I had been <laughs> doing all this for them for years at this point. Uh, eventually, Candy said, well, maybe, okay, you could work, you could do something. What would you like to do? And this would have been in uh, probably late 97. The site, I think, was canceled in 96. So this would have been late 97. And uh, I said, well, I don't know. I do, you know. She said, you do a call-in radio show. I was still doing this in uh, San Francisco. You do a call-in radio show. Um, what if you kind of, could you do that on TV? I said, yes. She said, how, how many hours could you do? <laughs> they were, I think at this point, <laughs> trying to figure out, they had, how do we fill 24 hours? And they had all these ideas for these you know, fancy shows like Internet Tonight. But they thought, well, I think this really was their thinking. We can kind of use Leo to fill until we get off the ground. Uh, I said, "Well, um, I could, I could." <laughs> I, I said, "Look, there's two different groups of people you're going to be talking to. There's the people who love computers, the enthusiasts, the people who, you know, probably first were introduced to computers playing video games, and they, you know, they love them because it's fun. And then there's a group of people who have to use computers for work. They were introduced to using Microsoft Office." And don't think it's so much fun, but no, they have to use it. Those are two different groups. Why don't we do two different shows? For the enthusiast, we'll do a show. It ended up being called The Screensavers. That's, you know, embraces their enthusiasm and shares it. And for the, um, the, 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 the tech worker, the normal, <laughs> we'll do a show um, Call for Help. It ended up being called uh, that is more, you know, kind of nuts and bolts. How many hours can you do? I said, well, I could do an hour each. Okay, good. Five days a week? I said, yeah, five days a week. Live? Because live's cheap. No editing. I said, yeah, live. That's what I'm doing now. Basically, it's the radio show on TV. Uh, they brought in a program uh, director from a former MTV guy, uh, Greg Drebin. Was very, he was very talented. He was very good. Uh, he was the guy, I remember sitting around in a brainstorming session uh, to come up with a name for these shows. And uh, he kept saying, let's call it Blowhole. <laughs> I think he was joking, but he said it several times. Uh, eventually, we came up with the screensavers. Um, it's hard to come up with a name even then because you had to have a website. You had a, you know, there couldn't have been anybody else doing it, et cetera. Screensavers was kind of, in hindsight, a terrible name. But, you know, okay. Call for help, even more kind of basic uh, we started rehearsing the shows. I said, um, I think they might have said, I can't remember how this happened. They might have said, you need a co-host. Who else would you like to work with? Uh, or I might have said, I can't handle this all by myself. And there was a person doing IT uh, around the offices uh, named Kate Patella, who was, you know, she was this one of those characters where she was an IT person, but in between she'd do song and dance. She was very uh, performance, Broadway show performance oriented. I said, you know, let's try out this woman, Kate Patello. I think she's got the chops. She certainly has the, she has the knowledge because she's in IT, but also she's really a performer and you need kind of both, right? 
Uh, so she worked out great. We rehearsed probably for six months, which is insane, uh, for a live TV show. Um, I really don't know why we, I mean, a week would have been fine. Same thing with Call for Help. The screensavers had a big budget. So we had a nice fancy set. Uh, at first, uh, you know, I said, I want to wear uh, bowling shirts or Hawaiian shirts. And, and Greg said, that's ridiculous. That's so trite, cliched, you can't know. But I ended up actually over time, they got me a lot. They actually had a, hired somebody to do wardrobe who went to a Goodwills and, and stuff, bought a lot of wardrobe. I still have some of that wardrobe. It doesn't fit very well, but I still have some of it, a lot of it, actually. Um, we found it later and I had it all dry cleaned. <laughs> and so it's in my, it's in my closet. <laughs> uh, they also, I said, they were saying, well, what do you want for a set? I said, well, it kind of should be like a garage. In fact, I thought, well, we'd have a remote control, and when somebody joins us, I'd open the garage door, and they'd walk in, and I'd close it. Um, and they didn't like that either, but it ended up kind of looking like, a, a, if you remember the screensavers, the old screens, the original screensavers said it was like a basement. In fact, they even had windows. And we brought in a really good uh, set designer, which I, who I used later for Twit, Roger Ambrose, who did it. A uh, really nice job of making it look like, you know, kind of we were in the basement somewhere, which was a, a kind of appropriate to the aesthetic. Call for Help was really low budget. So low budget, they didn't have enough lights for me to move. So there was only this very narrow alley that I could uh, move in, stand in, <laughs> back and forth. The Call for Help set was really cheesy. It was like some bookshelves, a podium, a table so I could put a computer on it. We had to solve a lot of things because, you know, the only computer shows up to that point were like Computer Chronicles. Uh, and we wanted to do something that looked a little bit better. So for the screensavers, we were trying to figure out how do we, how do we stand. I said, I don't want to look like we're standing at, uh, at the counter at Macy's. So we came up with what we called the penis table, which was kind of a, a, a long table that Patrick Kate originally, actually in the very early days, it was us standing in front of tables uh, in the first set. It was later that we came up with the, or was it? No, we might have had the penis, <laughs> the projectile set uh, in the early days. But Kate and I, or Patrick and I, would stand on either side of that. And that actually worked out well. We'd kind of be angled a little bit. You know, the other problem we had is how do you get the screens, the computer screens, uh, on the um, on the set, and, you know, on the TV. And uh, nowadays, that's really easy. You know, you just, I mean, that's trivially easy. But in those days, it was actually really, really difficult. Remember, we're we're shooting, we're doing this live, but we also have to record it. So they, because that was the other thing is, even though I was doing two hours a day, they would rerun it each show three or four times to get you know eight hours out of the twenty-four hour day filled. So we were really filler. Uh, and in order to shoot the screens. They didn't. They tried uh, different converter boxes. They were terrible. So they ended up having a camera, dedicated camera, plus operator, taking a picture of the screen. And you can't zoom in and out because you'll moire. It'll look weird. Uh, so it was a. It, it was a hard. It was a tough video challenge. But they ended up solving it and getting it working. And that was actually pretty cool. Um, so let's see what else. Um, the refrigerator, I think, started in the old set. <laughs> I think it was just there. And so Kate and I started putting things in it. Eventually, we put Chris Perillo in it at one point. <laughs> he was small enough to fit. <laughs> His nickname was Locker Gnome because they had done the same thing to him in high school. They stuffed him in lockers. So he felt at home, I guess. I remember that episode where we opened the door. There's We had usually opened the door. There was, you know, dry ice and fog and stuff, and we... You know, he'd pull out something uh, in that episode. And that was in the, the new set. We opened the door and Chris Perlow's there and he runs away. <laughs> uh, Kate and I built the ultimate gaming machine in the early days. Uh, and it was the coolest thing we got was this giant Sony monitor that was thousands and thousands. I think it might have been $10,000. Big CRT. It was huge. Weighed 100 pounds uh, in order to get a big monitor. <laughs> so that's how you did it back in 1998 we launched may 1998 uh this was uh this was when they had money greg uh brought in devo for the launch party um 
I don't know. I think he he probably had visions of it being the next MTV. It was not. At at its height, uh, the screensavers might have had uh, somebody. Some, some uh, a t- a TV columnist wrote the uh, audience size was that of a large high school. Might have been a little better than that, but it was about a hundred thousand people. Uh, saw any individual show at its best, 125,000 uh, on Tech TV. Uh, cable, at first, the cable, uh, you know, footprint was very, very small. In fact, if, uh, I think when we got on Dish, or it was not Dish, it was Direct TV, that was a big deal. That was, that was our first big score. At first, we were just on a few cable systems. Las Vegas, uh, in the southeast, there were a couple. I remember uh, at one point, our marketing people said, let's go to... We're gonna we're gonna go out and uh, do an event in Las Vegas to promote it for the cable company at a, at a computer store somewhere. And Kate and I said, "Well, can we go?" And they said, "Do you want to?" We said, "Yeah." So they they flew us to Las Vegas, and we had a rental car. We drove over to the Comp USA in the parking lot, and we arrive, and Kate grabs my arm, and she says, "Leo, there are people here." I said, what? And she said, yeah, there are a lot of people here. We had brought our uh, executive producer, Ken, Ken Marcus, with us. Uh, and he was a funny, fussy guy. He brought water, chapsticks, because it was really hot. It was Las Vegas in the summer, I think. It was really hot. It was like 110 degrees. And we, we got out of the car. Kate's like, I have claw marks in my arm from her fingernails. Because she said, there's people here. And there were, I mean, I don't know, there were maybe 100 people but still we had no idea that anybody was watching at all we also we wanted to take calls but we didn't want audio calls we wanted video calls again something in 1998 that was very difficult to do we ended up doing a deal with 3com to uh, distribute net cams we called them they wanted to call them webcams which is what they're called today i think and i said no this is me i'm in a nutshell i said well you know technically they're not webcams they're internet cameras (laughs) You don't use the World Wide Web for them. So we called them netcams, and we had the Tech TV 3Com netcam network. But we had to send netcams because nobody had them. And and the frame rate was, you know, very, very slow. And the audio just was terrible. So we ended up having people on the phone. And you'll see in many of the early calls, somebody's on, they'll be on the phone. There's a picture you know, one frame a second picture of them and them on the phone. But hey, we had we had video calls. Uh, it was it was a lot of fun, and I think in the early days the spirit was we're kind of inventing this. It probably was a little bit how it felt at MTV in the early days. We're kind of inventing this from scratch because no one's really know knows how to do this. I said I want to do it live. I don't want to. I don't want people to have a. Uh, I don't want to misrepresent how much these things crash and fail. So I want us to fail live on the air and fix it if we have to live on the air so that people know it's all in real time. It's all live. Yes, this stuff breaks. It's not your fault. That was kind of the motto of Call for Help. It's not your fault. This is, you know, this stuff breaks. It's there. It's, it's the industry's fault. And, uh, and I wanted to make sure we were truthful and honest about that. It was kind of hard to come up with ideas for segments. We did a bunch of segments um, about cleaning your mouse balls. I don't know why, but that was something that, you know, where you take the ball out of the mouse and <laughs> you clean it with alcohol. We did several of those because it was just hard to come up with, you know, stuff to talk about. Building the ultimate gaming machine was a good one. As time went by, it got more and more, you know, we, we found more and more things to talk about, especially as the community grew. Our early chat room was an avatar-based chat. Everybody had an avatar. I mean, people would move, <laughs> move around uh it was the metaverse back in 1998 wow uh so we had the chat room and 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 you know we would send people if they called a a refrigerator magnet (laughs) that said the screensavers uh, on it call for help was had a little different feel because it was really just me uh doing it uh my the first call on call for help was my mom Which is kind of embarrassing because it was like, oh, we really, nobody's watching. Nobody, not even, even my mom is, is all we can get. I think we all felt like that we were doing something fun and exciting. Everybody was pretty young except for me. Most of them had a, uh, just out of college. And, uh, and I kept telling them, remember this because uh, this is never going to be as good as this. And I was right.
So <laughs> it was it was a lot of fun. Well, you usually are right when it comes to that, Leo. Now, in 1998, a lot of people didn't own computers or really even understand how they worked. Shows like Call for Help and The Screensavers helped make this personal confuser a little more relatable for people. Um, for me, these shows really solidified my love for tech. What do you see as the legacy for the network and its shows? Well, the legacy is obvious, you know, because uh, people, you know, have moved on and continuing to do it. Uh, Michaela Pereira stayed in TV. She's worked for uh, the network. She's worked for KTLA. Uh, Kevin Rose became a multimillionaire <laughs> by investing early in uh, companies like Twitter. Uh, you know, Patrick and I and a number of other people ended up doing podcasts. Podcasts are kind of in some ways a spiritual successor of tech TV. It turned out, you know, uh, there was no money to be made in tech TV. Paul Allen lost hundreds of millions of dollars uh, because uh, I don't know why. I mean, it's hard to get on cable stations. Uh, so we only at, at, at the peak were in 41 million households, uh, which is not enough really to become profitable, especially the way we were spending money. They built two studios for redundancy, each more than a million dollars, you know, big Grass Valley switchers. You know, we had real cameras, real camera operators. We had floor directors. When we started, we had wardrobe mistress, we had makeup artists, uh, we had oatmeal in the commissary <laughs> in, the, in, the, in, the, in the break room. Uh, first, the wardrobe mistresses stopped. <laughs> You're on your own. <laughs> then there was no makeup. You could do makeup, right? <laughs> but we knew it was kind of close to the end when they, were, they took the oatmeal out of the uh, kitchen. That was like, hmm. <laughs> Mm, we must be in trouble. Plus, you'd start seeing these groups come around uh, shopping the network. Uh, but podcasting uh, gave, at least gave me the opportunity. I think Revision 3 was kind of like that. That was the other successor. Twit was one and Revision 3 was the other. To do basically the same thing, but at a fraction of the cost. Instead of million-dollar control rooms, we used consumer camcorders. Uh, you know, instead of camera operators, we just had a lot of cameras and would switch between them. You know, things like that. Revision 3 was a little more traditional. I really wanted to do this gorilla, uh, and uh, Twit's still around. So maybe that was the right uh, choice after 18 years. Um, but but we did do video, and I think that was probably part of the legacy of, of uh, Tech TV and ZDTV was I, I, I kind of thought it'd be good to have video so people could see what we're doing. Most podcasts are audio, obviously, and it's a lot cheaper and a lot easier. Video might have been a little bit of a <laughs> stretch for us. So the legacy is, uh, you know, that those of us who worked at it have kind of continued on uh, doing it in various ways. But the legacy is also, and I hear this all the time, there are a lot of people like you, Mike, there are a lot of people who became geeks or were geeks and were reaffirmed in their geekiness by the network and said, it's okay to be a geek. And I talked to people, grown-ups all the time who said, yeah, I grew up with on tech TV. I'm in IT now, or I'm in technology now, all the time. I think we actually spawned a generation of technology enthusiasts, by, especially with the screensavers, by showing them uh, that technology is fun, that there are other people doing it. Here's some of the things you can do. We knew that, I think, even at the time, that we were the voice for a generation of geeks who up to then had just been, you know, kind of abcast. It was really, that was really exciting. And I think we probably sold a lot of computers. Well, computers and peripherals, I know I made a lot of my uh, purchases based off of recommendations from the Call for Help or Screensaver show. Now, looking back, you did a lot of groundbreaking ideas that today we may take for granted. My first thought is the NetCam network and actually seeing the, the callers. This was really new. Um, now it's normal for news broadcast bloggers, uh, even myself, uh, to have guests through webcams. Um, not to mention how work from home, especially from 2020, 2022 uh, with COVID, has changed business dynamics. Are there any specific technical challenges that were particularly difficult to overcome at the network? Uh, is there anything that you were really proud of that you were able to accomplish? You know, it's funny because it didn't stop with tech TV. You know, when I started Twit, uh, I I started using Skype 
uh, first for audio and then for video for all of our shows. And it was really funny when the pandemic started to see see everybody, all the news networks starting to do the same thing and going through the same <laughs> learning curve that we had gone through years before, you know, how to do the mic, how to, <laughs> you know, they, they were for early on still allowing people to use, you know, uh, iPod headphones or iPhone headphones with scritch on the collar and sound terrible. I still see the AirPods, which is ridiculous. So there was... Uh, there it was we're still in the way we're a little bit groundbreaking uh and of course today you know i hear people uh talking about how uh, podcasting is suddenly taking off and i'm thinking yeah in 2004 <laughs> so i guess in a way we also showed podcasting could uh, could work looking back uh is there now outside of g4 is there anything that you would have done differently what do you think you got right as a, a host or a network and, and what things do you think you may have gotten wrong throughout the, your years i think honestly i i think it worked out amazingly well i'm not sure i would have done anything differently um except maybe a few fewer tequila shots but <laughs> other than uh, the hard partying um i think we actually did everything right the the, the channel was never going to succeed because the economics of it were wrong it was too expensive up front and couldn't justify itself but it taught us what we needed to do to make it work in on as an internet medium in fact i had always often said to them why are we doing this on cable you know, in order to get uh, on a cable system, you effectively have to go with bags of money to the regional operator. And every city has a different regional operator. So you have to go to Charlotte with a bag of money. They don't, it's not, they don't call it payoffs. They say it's marketing, uh, co-marketing dollars, co-branding dollars. Uh, the idea is in the end, you're going to make money from these affiliates, these cable companies. They're going to pay you a buck, three bucks per you know subscriber whatever the deal is but initially because they're not gonna you know nobody is gonna buy cable to watch tech tv you go with money co-marketing dollars to help them market it you know and that's thousands hundreds of thousands of bucks per city so it's a it's economically it's a nutty process paul allen i think in uh tech tv was on from 98 through 2004 six years he lost, by the way, this is pretty close to what I told CNET all those years ago. He lost 50 to $100 million a year for almost the entire time. I think they said he lost $300 million, so $50 million a year. That's exactly what I had told CNET. You're going to lose $50 million a year for 10 years before you turn a dime. And uh, we just never got that far. They sold it to uh, Comcast in 2004 before we were able to get that far. But that was not a my doing. Uh, I remember, I remember going to the you know executives, saying there are you know there are 14 million programmers in the United States at the time. Why are we dumbing down our programming? You should make it more technical. ESPN doesn't do shows on the rules of football or football for people who hate football. ESPN does shows for people who love football, and we should be doing shows. For people who love technology, we should be smartening it up. Instead, they're buying cops and, you know, uh, what was the puppet show with this? <laughs> Thunderbirds are a go. Instead of, instead of making it smarter, aiming harder at that tech audience, tech enthusiast audience. Uh, and actually, when I, I made this presentation to the, you know, the executives and the, the boss uh, at the time, who I'll, I'll leave his name out of this, not Greg Dribben, but uh, higher up, said, Leo, brands, brand is the refuge of the ignorant. Our advertisers don't want smart viewers because only dummies buy Tide and Coke in, you know, instead of Pepsi. Only dummies are fooled by brand. Now, I didn't have the presence of mind to say, yeah, that explains Apple, right? I mean, the guy was wrong. So management didn't understand what we were doing. Uh, 
Paul Allen, who was the owner, didn't understand. He understood. It's a funny thing. Uh, Greg Drebin's successor was called to the called on the carpet for Paul Allen, the owner, former Microsoft founder and one of the richest men in the world at the time. Uh, and Paul Allen says to him, "When are you going to make shows for me? For you know my kind of people?" And this idiot, I won't say his name, says, "Oh, never." We're never going to do that. <laughs> We're going to make it for a mass audience. That was a huge. That wasn't my mistake, though. That was their mistake, and it failed. Uh, and by the way, if Paul Allen owns your TV channel, he's no longer with us. But if somebody like Paul Allen owns you, you have an audience of one. You make the shows, and you make him happy. <laughs> so telling him never, I think, might have been a strategic mistake, although it was honest. And then they were promptly sold. So uh, that was, honestly, that was why Twit worked. Because we didn't talk down to people. We did shows for enthusiasts. And it's why Tech TV didn't work. Um, I don't think there's anything I would have done differently. I'm, I was uh, very grateful for what the screensavers and Call for Help and the people I worked with like Kate and Pat all the people there's so many names i love those people we had so much fun it was such a great experience uh the end was pretty horrible for me because <laughs> uh as soon as comcast bought it they fired me <laughs> they clearly wanted younger people to do the shows both patrick and i kind of found ourselves on the street worked out just fine for both of us uh less fine for the people who stayed with comcast and g4 um I'm I'm perfectly content with all the choices I made at the time. Again, with the exception of the tequila shots. Yeah, well, I think uh, tequila shots usually get the best of uh, of everyone. You had a lot of big players in the tech community over the years. Uh, Kevin Mitnick, Steve Wozniak. Uh, actually, both of those hosting together were probably uh, some of my favorite memories looking back. Who was your favorite guest that you got to have on the show? Oh, we had so many great guests. Loved Neil Gaiman. Uh, getting to meet him was amazing. Um, of course, Waz was on many times. Loved him. Loved Mitnick, too. They're, they were great. Um, God, so many people. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, we had... Um, uh, oh, I've forgotten her name now. Let me go look it up before I get it wrong. The uh, singer behind Tom's Diner. You know, probably uh, nowadays I will mention her name and nobody will know who I'm talking about, but Tom's Diner, <clears throat> Tom's Diner, as it turned out, was used by the folks at Fraunhofer when they created the MC3. They were uh, looking for a way to um, make sure that it was, it, you know, because MP3 is heavily compressed, right? They were uh, Suzanne Vega. They were looking for a way uh, to make sure that the human voice was reproduced accurately. And uh, Suzanne Vega had done an a cappella song called Tom's Diner. Do, 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 do. And uh, so they used that to refine the MP3 encoding, the compression algorithm for MP3. So knowing that, we had Suzanne Vega come in. Uh, and we had her sing Tom's Diner a cappella, not the big hit and was remixed later, but the a cappella version. And just sitting there and watching her sing that in the same uh, studio was pretty amazing. She, she, her boyfriend was back in New York and she was having trouble getting to him. So the other thing we did is we helped her get Skype working. I guess it was Skype. I don't remember what it was. It probably was Skype back then. Was this Skype around? We got Skype or, or something like it working. And we put him on a on a chair in a laptop and she got to talk to him, which was hysterical. Uh, we got to be the screensavers for Suzanne Vega. That's a very fun moment. Uh, Brian Eno uh, got to talk to him. He had just done a new album, The Great Composer, and uh, he gave me a copy of it yeah, signed, which one of my producers stole and still has. Uh, <laughs> but Eno, uh, his claim to fame, he was a geek too, was... No one knew how to program the synthesizer he used better than he. 
and uh, it was there were so many great moments. And honestly, it wasn't the big name guests, the Kevin Spaceys of the world that I really cherish and remember. It it was the people that I worked with, you know. Um, they were all incredible, and uh, we were a very tight knit, close family, and it was uh, really an amazing experience uh, to be with them. And uh, I think honestly, that was the best part of the show. Not the famous people, but 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 the people I got to work with every day. Yeah, I remember that Tom's Diner episode. Uh, that's still a really great song. It's probably one of my favorite songs, and it's a really interesting story behind it as far as uh, MP3s are concerned. We have a lot to thank, um, you know, digital audio for that. Now, I know that there was and still is personal friendships between all the members, and that realness um, between, uh, I don't want to say the cast, but between the hosts, you, Pat, Sarah, Kat, Martin, uh, Yoshi, the list can go on. That realness was what made it feel like a family. And as I'm doing some of these interviews, I realize, you know, it still is a family. You guys might not be working together, um, but that was a very real dynamic. Um, it was fun. Can, can you expand on this a little bit more? Um, yeah, Pat. Uh, Pat was uh, working for ZD uh, when um, we started uh, Tech TV. In fact, we'd had him on. I think I had him on a couple of times at Call for Help. Patrick Norton, one of the things he did at ZDTV was he did a lot of benchmarking uh, in the ZD uh, labs in Foster City and stuff. Uh, he wrote a lot for the magazine. So I brought him in, and I'll never forget, the first time we had him on Call for Help, he was shaking. I don't, poor Pat. He was shaking like a leaf. He was so nervous. Uh, um, but I loved him, and I knew that he would be a great person when Kate decided to leave the screensavers. She was very busy. She was also doing the virtual reality character, Tilda. And when she decided to go to the game show uh, uh, and, and leave the screensavers, Patrick was just kind of the obvious uh, choice. Um, the program director at the time said, yeah, he's for the lunch bucket crowd, which I thought, well, I don't know about that. But uh, he was definitely the, you know, the kind of down to earth genuine real guy not a tv personality i was i'm a little too greasy a little too uh too smiley so having i needed some it was good to have somebody with a little more rough edge and people loved him and his sledgehammer and his and his utila kilts <laughs> i'll never forget the day patrick persuaded all of us me martin uh to wear uh kilts the utila kilts for the show and uh and i did a little twirl and the kilt i didn't realize this but the kilt those pleats really catch the air. And it went, whoo! <laughs> I went, whoa! <laughs> Not the first time that I streaked on Tech TV, but uh, I think the last time. Um, Kat was great. Always great working with Kat and Sarah. You know, Sarah, we ended up uh, working together for a very long time because I, after, it took me a while to persuade both Megan and Sarah I, I really had to work to persuade to do podcasts on Twit, but I did. <laughs> and and we worked with them for both for years, which was really nice. So we did kind of keep, and Patrick too, actually. He did uh, This Week in Computer Hardware for us. He was a regular on a number of our shows, even on the new screensavers. In fact, that was one of the things that we did. That I, we, we started a show on the, the podcast network called The New Screensavers. NBC sent us a cease and desist letter. And we went, mm, you let the trademark expire. Bye-bye. And uh, um, at, at one point, we got Kate to fly out from Michigan and uh, be on it with me. And that was really fun. I wish that show had succeeded. I don't know why it didn't. Maybe because it was a variety show. And uh, nowadays, our audiences are very specific in what they want. But anyway, that was so much fun, uh, re recreating that. Um, Yoshi, man, those boxes he built. Yoshi was the mod king. You know what? He turned it into a pretty successful career. Um, building props and sets for uh, the movies. So, you know, he actually kept on doing it too. Um, never was able to get him on any one of our shows. I've had Pat, Sarah, um, Martin. I don't know if I've ever gotten Cat back on one of our shows, but but ne never, never could get Yoshi to do it. It was really uh, a good time for everybody. I would love to see you and Yoshi back together again. Uh, you know, some of the mods that guy did was absolutely amazing. And I think it was a big inspiration for myself early on getting into uh, case modding when um, 
it was still new, still fairly cutting edge. Um, so the last question I have for you, Leo, and I'm really uh, curious on, uh, on your thoughts and answers to this. Can you shed some lights on the origins of the um, short films Leo's Angels and Tectanic? Um, this was part of a screensavers fan fiction. Um, what, what was this? Was there plans to do more? It seemed, um, it was interesting and entertaining, but it seemed a kind of a, a deviation from uh, what the network was doing at the time. I can't take any credit for that. <laughs> I really don't want any credit for it. So, so some of it was Kate. Tectanic was Kate. She was very creative and she was an actor. And so that was her her whole her whole thing. We were always like we were always trying to make it more fun. We knew the technology was great and we were really into it and interested, but we also knew it had to be it's TV, it had to be fun. Uh, at one point towards, you know, the last couple of years of the screensavers, um, I kind of got demoted uh, and they brought in a uh, executive producer hotshot from Hollywood. He had his, I don't know how hot of a hotshot he was. His credits were he had been, uh, he had worked on The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson as a booker. And uh, he did, uh, he produced Alan Thicke's show, The Thick of the Night. So... <laughs> Hey, but he had more experience than any of us. So uh, he came in. Uh, we took him to lunch, I remember. This is when my alarm bell started going off. And he said, you know what the screensavers really needs? I said, what? He said, more cleavage. And uh, I was very unthrilled by that. And so he created uh, Leo's Angels, which I never really liked the idea. You know, the, I played along with it, and that probably looked like an ass. I know I looked like an ass, but, you know, they had the, what do they call it, the babe corral or something where the people answering the phone, they used to be back in a hall behind the set, in the old set. They were never intended to be on camera. They're just people getting the callers ready and putting them on the air. And, all, you know, a lot of them were guys. Um, but Paul wanted to get more sex appeal on the show, so he made sure that the new set had a big place for them to sit prominently on camera. Uh, and he really played up, you know, the sex appeal of Jessica and, and, and Megan and everybody. And, I, you know, I, I guess I foolishly played along, but it was not my idea. And I always kind of resented it. I, you know, I always think it's a bad idea. It seems to be a very common idea when you go to trade shows, you know, and booth babes and stuff. Fortunately, an idea that's dying out. But it always, but at the time, it was a common idea to add sex appeal. I don't, I never thought that was a good idea. I always, I liked Kate's idea, which is make it fun, make it entertaining. She used to do <laughs> a beat poet thing where she would do beat poetry and I had a little goatee and I'd play the bongos behind her and we'd do techno beat poetry. That was more my speed. I liked that stuff. I liked it to be clever. Um, but we got brought in a Hollywood producer and that's what we got. And of course, that, among many other reasons, was why Tech TV disappeared. The best years of Tech TV were the earliest years, the ZDTV years. We did have to change the name, by the way. We'd call, uh, you know, our salespeople would call up and say, I'm calling from ZDTV. And they thought it was a network about pasta. They didn't understand what ZDTV was. So uh, after Paul Allen uh, invested in it, and after about a year and a half, we said, you know, we need a better name. Let's say Tech TV. As bland as that is, at least it's what we are. And actually, that was a smart move. Uh, but the best, I think the best years were 1998, 1999. Uh, I'll never forget, you know, after 9-11 uh, in 2001, uh, you know, we shut down immediately. But when we came back a couple of weeks later, we had kind of a candlelight visual. It was moments like that um, that really, I think, were where we were at our best. Uh <laughs> It was later <laughs> uh, when the network got desperate trying to get an audience up and they went mainstream uh, that I think the, the, it started to fall apart. And, and in fact, that's exactly what happened. And, you know, that's why Twit's pretty darn geeky. Anyway, thanks for asking. That was a lot of fun. Absolutely. A lot, a lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leo. And thank you for watching. If you want more Leo Laporte fix, or if you just want more technology podcasts, I highly, highly recommend This Week in Tech 
twit.tv. This is where you can find podcasts not only hosted by Leo, but a lot of amazing people in the tech world. Go over, join, listen. I know I have this in my weekly podcasting schedule. While you're subscribing and liking, don't forget to like us on Twitter at Retro Tech or Die. And of course, like and subscribe for this video and stay tuned for more Tech TV content. Music